Hey guys, how you doing? We're going to go over the mixing session that I had for the song I recently released on my YouTube channel. So we're going to go over everything from beginning to end. I want to go over the signal chain with you guys, the guitar, the cable, the audio interface, and basically everything in the DAW. And we're going to go over uh, all the techniques and all the minor things that I use to apply to get a good mix. We're going to go over the complete signal chain that was used to go over this entire recording process from tracking down to mixing down to mastering. So I don't want to hold too much time. Let's get right into it. So first of all, we have the session open right here. But before we get into that, let's go over the complete signal chain that was used to to record and track everything. All right. So the guitar that was used to track this this recording session here it was my Legator Ghost G7 FP. We don't need to get into the statistics of the uh, the guitar specs itself. I have a different video for that, by the way. But we will go over the pickups that we use. They are Fishman Fluence Abasi 7s. All right. All right, so the cable that was used for this is a Diodario oxygen-free copper uh, cable. I don't know if I have an item number for you because I'm not seeing it on the actual cable, but... I'm sure it's not that important. It's just a standard high quality cable from Diodario. Figure it out. Okay, and that signal is going straight into my Focusrite Scarlet 2i2 interface. Nothing fancy. No fancy preamps. No processing. Just straight up guitar going into the interface. Anyway, getting into the DAW here. Again, nothing fancy. We're just recording straight into the digital audio workstation here. And um, let's go over the guitars first. So as you can see in the guitar tracks, all we used was the archetype Gojira plugin over here. Now I used the Hawk and Chunk preset over here because I really like the way it sounded. I don't think I made any tweaks or if I did, just go ahead and, uh, and kind of copy the settings over here. Nothing in the pedal section, nothing in the other pedal section. Amp over here with the matching cab. Uh, I did do some tweaking in the EQ over here. And mind you guys, I do a lot of cutting in the low end from the bass tone with all my guitars. Only because, you know, it does tend to interfere with the bass track in terms of that frequency range. So yeah, I do cut out a lot of the 65, the 125. And I start to boost it around 20, 250 hertz. This is where I like to believe that the true low end of the guitar lies in a mixed session it's not going to be over here this is going to be more for like a live band situation you can use these frequencies here but i tend to cut out a good amount of it and i tend to use the 250 hertz as the low end point and everything from here was just to taste uh the middle frequencies uh i know some people like to cut the 4k frequencies here because it kind of gives it that that digital sizzle that a lot of people don't like but in this case uh, I did end up liking it a lot. It sounded very natural to me, so I go ahead and I went ahead and boosted it slightly over here. I left the 8K and the 16K because it sounded just fine to me. Now, when it comes to the cap section, I'm not sure if I made any tweaks. I may have changed the mic to the condenser 414, but if you want, go ahead and you can copy these settings over here. This is what I use for both left and right pans of the guitar. And there was no reverb or delay used in my track. Now the beauty of this mix is that I decided to go with completely stock Ableton plugins to mix and master the track. Now what my setup consists of is a double hard drive PC slash Hackintosh. Now in my Hackintosh side of things I do have all my fancy plugins such as the Waves bundle, I have the, um, the Fab Filter bundle which I like to use with their compressors, reverbs, and limiters. Uh, but just for the sake of keeping things bare bones and to kind of keep that dream alive of that you don't need fancy plugins to mix and master or to even track. So I decided to just go with only Ableton plugins for this one. So we're gonna keep true to that word and here we go. All right, so moving on into the guitar bus. Now, both my right and left guitars are being sent to the guitar bus and then the guitar bus is being sent to the master track over here. But as you can see, super simple, nothing complicated. Now, I use the EQ8 and um, there's a couple of things that I want to go over with how I approach EQing guitars. Now, if you don't mind, let me veer off into like a different subject over here is because 
the way I started getting into the process of learning how to mix and master was, and I'm sure you're, I'm sure you do the same thing too, is I like to go ahead and try to copy some famous YouTubers mixing and mastering process down to a T. And I think, uh oh, uh oh, my PC doesn't have a condom on and is having premarital sex. Sorry. Now, one thing to realize that that's going to be a good method to kind of get you get your feet wet into you know mixing and mastering in terms of the basics of it in some sense such as what plugins to run where and you know uh, how to arrange your plugins in right order and just the very basics but something i tended to learn as i was mixing and mastering on my, on my own was that every track is going to be completely different it's not going to be the same thing applied to every track meaning you can't just copy some famous YouTubers settings and plugins and just expect it to work. You got to keep in mind that, you know, everyone is using different guitars, everyone is using different cables, different interfaces, uh, different playing styles, even different tunings is a big one. Having the guitar in different tunings is huge because the guitar just doesn't respond the same way as it did in a one tuning as it will in another tuning. So that's another thing. I can't just pick up a guitar that's tuned to this track, which is a drop G tuning, and then use my standard E tuning and expect it to sound just as good. So, which is why I recommend, you know, maybe having a starting base plate of where you want to go, meaning I can open up this template, track with it, and then once I'm done tracking, I can listen to the mix with the plugins already in there, but make minor tweaks because not every guitar and not every tuning is going to sound the same with that being said i started scratch with this session and here's what we did we did cut out a lot of the of the low end here okay and another thing i got to mention is the way i go about eqing guitars is two things one first and foremost you cut out all that low end I hate to say it, but your guitars are not going to sound good with all that bass because it's going to mush with the bass track and it's just not going to sound good at all. I'm sorry. I know you're wearing guitars beefy and juicy, but beefy and juicy don't mix with the bass's beefy and juicy. It's too much beef and too much juice. I never thought I would have to say that, but here we are. I'm telling you guys too much beef and too much juice together don't mesh well. So anyway, generally around the, uh, the, the 90 hertz over here is a good starting point to cut it out with. But one thing you can do is you can kind of solo out the guitars and the bass and kind of get a good feel of where to cut the bass. Can you unsolo this? Yeah, I could kind of hear the bass to spring, but not, not drastically, and that's only because we cut the bass out in the actual plugin too, over here. But, just for good measure, I don't need any of these frequencies here, which is why I cut them all out like that. Okay. Then the next thing I do is I like to find all the problem frequencies with the guitar tracks. Now, I don't care how clean your guitar signal is. Every guitar signal is going to have really bad frequencies that you want to just cut out completely. So let's go ahead and listen to some of those. So first being this frequency I found sounded really ugly and let me show you guys how you find the ugly frequencies in this. So what you do is when you're starting out with a flat EQ curve, you, meaning you haven't done any edits to the EQ whatsoever, what you do is you click a band, right? And you could start from any spectrum, but I like to start from the mids because the mids tend to be the ugly side of the guitar, the really ugly frequencies, mid to mid high and even all the way high and then maybe even some over here in this like 500 range ish it really just depends so what i do is i pick a band and i boost the living shit out of it like this you want to have a slightly uh thin cue you don't want it too thick because you don't want to listen to a lot of groups of frequencies you only want to listen to one one group of it oops let me just solo this one So yeah, in solo mode, you'll go ahead and click the band and you'll listen for really ugly frequencies. Right here. That shit is ugly. 
Ugh. Even here, disgusting. Yeah, here, here is acceptable, but right here, ugly. So what you do is cut it out of your life. Bye bye. Already sounds clean, right? Same thing I did with over here. You could just hear that fizz, that disgusting piss fizz that I don't like. If you boost it here, it just sounds horrible. So again, right here. Once you find it, drop the game down. Boom. Sounds much cleaner already. And then I usually tend to cut all this high frequency out because you're not going to need it. Like if you were to listen to all this fizz, it's too much. You know, it's just, it's unnecessary. You don't need it. So just cut it out. Now the result is a much cleaner sound, if I may, for the mix. This is what it sounds like without. You hear all that ugly fizz, the top and the middle, the, the mid to mid high frequencies, like right around here. It's ugly. Let's just listen to that again. Now here's what it sounds like with the EQ. It's much cleaner on, on the ears. You know, everything gets through. Yeah, it's much, much cleaner on the ears. These ugly frequencies don't need to be in there. Just get rid of them. Simple as that. So when it comes to EQ, that's what I do. And then uh, what I like to do is basically glue compress with the uh, hint hint glue compressor from Ableton. So we can get into a long conversation about what compressors do because there's so many different kinds out there and I think maybe one of these days I should make a video regarding it. But I am happy to say that the Ableton compressor, both the glue and the regular are very, very good. Uh, I think for stock Ableton plugins, they're pretty damn good. So what I wanted to achieve with this is generally I like to compress down to about a five to six dB range. But again, it's better to use your ears. And just using the glue compressor by itself without getting in too detailed about it, I thought this setting sounded really good. Let me solo the guitar. So let's listen to what it sounds like without it. Not bad. I mean, you could just bring up a limiter so all those frequencies could just... Yeah, not bad. You can use a limiter with it if you want to, to bring up all the quiet frequencies up. But what I really needed was for all the peaks to kind of be squashed in a little bit so it's a little easier to mix, in my opinion. So that's where the glue compressor, com that's where the glue compressor comes in. Really short attack, an extremely short release. I do a 4 to, four to 1 ratio. And I mess with the threshold where it barely surpasses that 5 dB mark. That's just the way I prefer it for a final mix. And if I needed more dB out of it, I just used the makeup right here, which I did. I boosted it up to 8.25. Cool. And all the way wet. You can mess with the range here, but I think if it went any further than 6.3, 6.5-ish, uh, you know, it'd be overkill. So I just set the range over there. Cool, that about does it for guitars. Now let's move on to the bass. Now for this bass track, I decided to go for simplicity's sake, you know, a very basic route, just processing one bass track and that's it. Now the source tones from this are coming from the Submission Audio Gin Bass over here. Let me just drag it to the main window. There you are. And, um, it's pretty crazy. I actually have a couple of really nice basses over here, but I get kind of lazy when it comes to bass tones only because uh, I don't have a top tier tone per se when it comes to my bass guitars. But what the cool people of Submission Audio have done is they've went ahead and sampled a Dingwall bass over here. Uh, and I don't know what amplifier they modeled in here, but it actually sounds really good. That meshes really well with heavy guitars and drums. So if you guys want to hear what that sounds like soloed, Check it out right here. Cool. Now the settings for this are pretty simple. Volume all the way up. You don't want the width to be any higher than zero. Only because bass is generally meant to be a mono instrument. Kind of set in the middle. And when we go over to mastering, 
on that portion you'll find out why but the guitars and everything don't mesh well when you turn the width up all the way you don't want that stereo effect you want the bass to sit right in the middle so just leave that all the way down now if you want a raw di you could just hit the power button and it'll be the raw di version but i really really like the tone of the power being engaged the amplifier being engaged along with the dirty channel this is like the medium dirt and this is the super crunchy version tone all the way up uh for the sake of my session here i made the alternate picking it to quarter notes so i'm not going to do 16th notes or eighth notes it's just going to stick to one two three four one two three four one two three four uh string noise all the way up muting noise all the way up as well now when it comes to the, uh, to the processing of this i do kind of go for the same approach as guitar but sort of the opposite yes we do try to find the ugly frequencies that's definitely in almost any guitar or bass track in my opinion uh, obviously anything past that 100 to 90 range I'll, I'm sorry anything before the 90 to 100 range I wanted to boost up and I only did this just for taste uh, I felt like the those frequencies down there were a bit quiet so just listening back to the to the whole track yeah as opposed to starting starting from the flat even over here it just didn't cut through very well and i know i'm getting a good signal on my bass over here so i just decided to go ahead and boost the crap out of it until it sounded good to me right over there and yeah you know just cutting out the ugly frequencies like before this was an ugly one right here yeah for some reason didn't really enjoy that frequency that much Yeah, another ugly frequency they can get out of my life right there. And yeah, just didn't really need all the high end over here. A little too much fizz, so I got rid of it. Now, for this one, uh, for the compressor, I didn't really need the glue compressor because I'm not meshing a bunch of instruments together. This is only one instrument. And this is what it sounds like without it. Yeah, you might not be able to hear the difference, but it does make a big difference in the mix. Only because some of the upper transients, I want them to squish down a little bit. I didn't want them peaking too much in the signal because certain hits would peak too much. So I wanted them nice and squeezed. That way I can control it easier in the mix. The ratio I used was 130 to 1. 0.02 for the attack. Very fast attack. A slightly slower release. And for the Ableton compressor, I love to use the uh, this gain reduction menu over here so you can kind of see what it's doing to the waveform some people like it in this menu some people like it with uh, this meter over here but i really like seeing what it's doing to the waveform you know, that way if i were to push this i can see how much it's squeezing that waveform the peaks of it so yeah and then i leave it on peak mode i do have some makeup on there and i just drive the wet all the way up all right and last but not least let's go over the drums so uh, one thing I will always urge every drum sampling maniac to do, no matter what drum sampler you use, is absolutely route every single instrument into its own channel. Now, you can find a bunch of videos on this already on YouTube by a lot of experts who have figured it out. But the way I mapped mine was, basically this is my mini mapping channel. There's no, there's no audio on this one. And this is where I do all my mini mapping and writing. And the individual instruments are being sent out to its own channels of kick, snare, the rack toms, four toms, hi-hat, overheads, and the room over here. So that way you can have complete control over every instrument of your drum sampler as opposed to having it all under one channel, which can really complicate the way how you want to process the kick and snare and everything by itself. Uh, some drum samplers, you can do that within the sampler menu, uh, within contact or whatever you're using. But the only issue is that most drum samplers, they're very limited with their plugin capability. Such as here in GGD Invasion, all I really have to work with is a pinch control, envelope filter, reverb, and a turbo, which is some kind of a, I think it's like a compressor or something. I don't even know what the turbo really does. Um... But yeah, it's. I highly recommend sending off every. Ugh. That was weak. 
I recommend sending every channel off to its own audio channel in here. And that way, if you want wire mixing, you can go ahead and you can go ahead and listen to every track by itself. Kick, the snare. I don't know where my toms are, but you get the idea. So yeah, it's better to go this route. Just trust me on it. So first, let's talk about all the individual drum channels I got. So first and foremost is the all important kick right here. Kick is definitely the foundation when it comes to metal drumming. Um, there's not much to say about it. I mean, every metal song you listen to, that kick is that rhythmic driving force of the song. So the way I process the kick in this instance is, and this is the way I usually go about every metal song I do, is those middle frequencies tend to be kind of ugly. I don't want to say ugly because a lot of them have a lot of life in it, but you want that kick to be very clicky and very beefy at the same time. That's what makes a metal kick a metal kick. So basically, I didn't boost the first band at all over here. I just dropped these middle frequencies and I just boosted up the high over here. So that's what got me that really clicky bass drum that I like. And I use the compressor here to, to squeeze it out, squeeze out the transients to the peaks to a nice manageable level. Yeah, one of these days we'll get into how to do like a parallel compression with kick drums, but that's gonna be in a later video because that's pretty important in processing a kick drum as well. But for this, in this instance, I'm doing a series compression, which means the signal's going through the compressor and basically it's shitting it out into the mix. And yeah, I'm basically just using the compressor to squeeze it here, squeeze out the transients. And you could kind of look at my, my settings over here. Okay, moving on to the snare. All right, just a tad bit more processing in the snare here. So let's go to the part that has some actual snare. All right, so the way I process the snare is starting with the EQ as usual. Uh, anything below this this band over here, these little frequencies, I think below 90 or 80, you don't really need them. It, that, those are bass frequencies, and you may as well just cut out any unnecessary frequencies in your mix. And I kind of, I do kind of follow the same approach here when it comes to processing my snare. It's somewhat similar to my kick, where the middle frequencies could have some life into them, but there are sometimes, if you want a nice beefy snare, you're gonna want to cut those out. So here's what it sounds like without it. Yeah, you kind of hear those middle frequencies. It kind of makes, you can hear a lot of overtones and for some reason I wanted a really fat, deep snare. So what I did was just cut out most of the mids. Cranked up this, um, what band is this? This is about what, 150-ish or 200? Two to 300-ish right here. I just decided to boost because that's the part of the snare drum that had a lot of body to it so I wanted to boost that part of the snare and over here I just raised up the high end a little bit because it sounded really good with that upper crack kind of coming through into the into the mix same deal with the compressor here I decided to go with a infinity to one ratio here because I want to squeeze the living crap out of it really short attack a somewhat short release of 50 ms uh, and then I just played with the blue bar until I got the proper amount of squeezing over here, which satisfied my ears. Turn the makeup on, put it on peak mode, 100% wet. Simple as that. Now, the reverb took some tweaking, but this one's gonna be mostly the taste. Because uh, uh, generally when you put the reverb on, on your track, the high cut is engaged and the low cut is not engaged. And in this case, I don't want a lot of low frequencies of the reverb to push through. So I went ahead and put the low cut on and I didn't want these frequencies past 3.31 kilohertz to pass through. And then it's just a matter of playing with the dry wet, with the stereo knob, the decay time to reflect, until you get a decent reverb tone out of it. And that's basically it. Okay, moving on to the, to the rack toms, and this is basically the same deal. Let me find a part of my song that has rack toms. Sheesh, I don't even know. Let's see. Hmm, I should look into maybe over here. Hmm. 
I don't know where there's a single. Oh, right here, right here. It's coming up. Alright. Okay, is there any more than that? Okay. This is the only part of my song that has one rack tom, apparently. I guess I like to use the floor ones a lot more. So let's go ahead and loop it so we can hear what's going on. The way I process the rack toms is pretty similar to the way I do with the kick drum is I wanted a nice beefy rack tom tone. So boosted up the highs, boosted up the lows, drop a lot of the mids. This particular setting sounded really good for me, so I went and kept it and then just compressed it as well. Here's the ratio, the short attack, and the release that I set on it. And just play with the blue, the blue bar until I got a proper setting on it. Wet all the way up, peak on, makeup on as well. Now, for the floor toms, it's a little different the way I process these bad boys. Yeah, so for this one, for some reason, I didn't really like this low end range right here, the sub range. It was really interfering with the bass track as I was live mixing. So uh, I went ahead and cut some of that out. I did notice that most of the body is here where this number one band is. So I kind of did boost it a little bit, drop the mids and raise up the highs for a beefy tone. Here are the compressor settings for this one. Go ahead and copy them if you want. 268 to one. Uh, I always like a short attack and um, a short to medium release for most of my shells. And then just play with the blue bar until you get that nice crunch on the signal. Makeup on, peak on. And this one, for some reason, I didn't want to really compress it when it came to the actual mix. So this is some example of a parallel compression here where some of the dry signal is coming through. And along with the dry signal, the wet signal is sitting right in there. So it kind of becomes a parallel compression in some sorts. But we'll get into that in some other video. Okay, on the hi-hat, I didn't think I needed much uh, processing over here. Put a nice open part right here. Yeah, pretty basic. Um, I just cut out a little bit of the mid frequencies and it definitely didn't need any low, even though I don't think there was any. But you may as well just cut it out that way. If there were any low frequencies, you can just get rid of it. And that's it. Nothing else on the hi-hat. Now, when it comes to the overheads here for the cymbals, let's go to a part of the song that has cymbals. I want more cymbals than that. Okay, that's a good point right there. All right, so for the overheads, pretty simple, cut out a lot of the low end and boosted the high frequency range just a tad bit. Nothing crazy. Now on the compressor here, I'll be honest, I'm not sure why I put it. Maybe I use it just for the makeup option here so I can bring up some of the the low transients and bring them up a little bit, kind of like a limiter. Because it's really not compressing the signal whatsoever. So that's without it. And that's with it. Yeah, I can kind of hear the quiet parts getting a little louder, so that's probably why I used it. And then just a touch of reverb over here. Again, this one is going to be for more for personal taste rather than, you know, take my settings and put them on your track to make it sound instantly good. You're going to have to play around with this one on your own. Cool, and last but not least, the room. I actually didn't do any processing whatsoever. Maybe there's a chance I may have done it in GGD. But highly doubt it. No, in fact, I turned most of the rooms off for everything except for the cymbals because Generally, when you're recording an actual drum kit with mics, what some pro engineers will do is, is though with microphones, you're obviously going to pick up a little bit of everything. The overheads are going to pick up the bass drum. The overheads are going to pick up the snare and vice versa. Bass drum mic might pick up the overhead, the, the cymbals as well, or the rack toms. So what's cool about drum sampling is if you want to make it really realistic and you want to do something of a simulation of sorts with that kind of scenario, you could just bump these rooms up all the way and see you can hear that the bass drum is now is now coming through into the mix. But what's cool about drum samples is you don't need to include all that into 
your complete drum mix here. Because what engineers will do is they'll go ahead and start gating. By gating, I mean they'll put a, a, a gate plug in onto the bass drum, onto the snare, and all the toms. Because once that bass drum gets hit, they don't want any of the after stuff to bleed in through the mics. But like I said, in this case, we're kind of cheating and it's kind of nice. We don't have to mess with that. We could just turn all the rooms off for everything except for the overheads. And that way it's not going to bleed into the kick. And you're just getting the kick signal. And watch, let me show you for an example here. If I were to, in the kick here, if I were to raise the room a little bit. You could kind of hear in the background, right? Oh wait, you're not going to be able to hear it. Let me show you why. Let's start that over again. Here, let me show you as an example here. Let's just say if I were to solo the kick and the room. And we go into GGD here. Now, the kick has no, no signal going into the room whatsoever. So all you're really hearing right now is just the the overheads because the overheads do have room on there. Let me turn those off. Cool. So all you're hearing is just the kick because nothing is being sent to the room. But if you happen to have the room on on this, you hear that? That's something that a lot of pro engineers are trying to get rid of in the kick signal. They want the kick to sound like this. No interference, no nothing. So that's what's great about drum samplers is that you can go ahead and cut out the room out of any microphone you want. And it's less of a headache doing it in here as opposed to putting in uh, gate plugins on your individual drums and trying to cut out the extra noise that's coming within there. Okay, cool. Cool, and then uh, coming into my drum bus over here, um, at first I had plans to both use a glue compressor and a saturator, but I didn't like how distorted the saturator made it sound, so we're gonna just go with the glue compressor for now. And yeah, same deal here, I dropped the range down to about 5 dB or 4.54 dB. Medium attack, uh, somewhat medium of a release. The ratio I bumped up just because I figured it sounded really good like that when it compressed a whole lot, a whole lot of it. Uh, threshold, I didn't want it to go past 5 dB, so I left it at 28.9 minus. Did a little makeup, and I didn't go all the way with the dry wet. 69% sounded good to me. Nice. Cool. That about does it. Let's go over how I edit my drums into a little more in-depth look because I'm sure some of you guys are going to have questions about how I map my drums over here. And for me, it's all up to what the song needs and what kind of song I'm producing. But essentially, this one's pretty simple. Um, to give the drums more life, because if you just go ahead and mini map everything and not set the velocities and not apply a little swing to it, it's going to sound very robotic and fake. So the way I did it was I messed with the velocities as best as I could in groups. And the way I would do that is once I'm done tracking the bass drum here, I'll go ahead and grab my, my, uh, my writing tool or my drawing tool for the MIDI. And is, what I'll do is I'll sort of kind of draw out what I think the velocity should be. And I'll kind of do a little random line over here just so it adds a little more realism because not every bass drum hit in real life is the same amount of pressure to the bass drum pedal. So this can give you some flexibility on how hard the bass drum pedal should be. And you can get a little creative. You kind of have to think like how a real drummer would hit the bass drum, such as the very first hit over here of the song. There's a good chance that he might hit it a lot stronger. And as the middle of this part over here, he might get weaker and weaker. So I might want to bring it down a little bit more. And stuff over here, like such as the bass drum part uh, pattern, and over here, a good example is the bass drum pattern. Generally, what drummers will do as they're doing the double bass pattern is the hits will start to get weaker than an actual regular standard quarter note hit. 
So here you can actually release, I'm sorry, not release, but bring down the velocity, oops, a little more. Yeah, let's get out of drawing mode. And the way you can do that is you can just highlight these double base hits right here. And you can use go into draw mode and draw it just a little bit lower than usual than the other uh, bass drum hits. So that's how this one will sound. Okay, that's a little too low. So let's bring it up a little more. Let's see how that sounds. Okay, not bad. But see, in this case, I actually do think it would sound better for the sake of the track if it was somewhat cohesive with the rest of the bass drum hits. So yeah, again, this is all down to personal taste. You kind of have to think like a drummer in this case. You know, how hard would I hit the snare drum in certain parts if I'm doing a really fast 16th note roll? Am I going to hit it all really, really, really hard? Or am I going to do some ac accents and whatnot? In fact, I think I do have a part of the song where I do apply a little bit of an accent in. Let me try to find it. It's going to be somewhere over here. Yeah, right over here, if you listen to the snare drum, I applied a little bit of a kind of like a roll feeling where the triplet part of the snare drum hit is I kind of slowly started to rise up the, the uh, velocity on there. So did you hear that? So that's right over here. Here are the velocity hits. See, it starts very quietly and slowly starts to go up. Because generally, let me bring my mic down so you can hear it. Whenever a drummer wants to do a triplet roll, right here, let me do it on wood. What it'll sound like is drummers won't hit that all at the same velocity. It won't go very rare in a real application of a song. Most of the time it'll be, see how those first two hits of the triplet were really light? Oops. So yeah, you have to kind of think like a drummer and, and think to yourself, how would the drummer hit the snare drum? So which is why I mapped the velocity to match how a real drummer would do it. Really hard first hit and then kind of roll off the velocities as the roll goes. Cool. So yeah, play with the velocities as much as you want. Just make a sound as real as possible. And then the only thing I applied to the MIDI drums to make it sound as realistic as possible is I added some swing over here. Now, in every DAW, swing is going to be different. Uh, but generally, every DAW has the option to add swing to MIDI. And what swing is, basically, the loose translation is, uh, the more you apply swing to MIDI, the less tighter it is in terms of it's actually glued to the grid of your time signature of your session. So in this case, we're doing 130 BPM here. If there was no swing applied, and if you take a look at the MIDI, every single hit would have been applied right at the dot of every downbeat of you know, the, the count, essentially. The 4-4 four, four count or triplet count, whatever. But what I did was Ableton has this nifty feature over here where you can go into, where are the swings? I think the swings are in here. Oh, is it in my, all right, here it is, yeah. So what you can do is you can go into your packs and this comes with every Ableton uh, program. You can go into the swing and groove. And naturally, I went to the rock section. Oh, I did not actually. Uh, I went to swing. Okay. And this one, you're going to have to mess around with a little bit. I'll be completely honest. I don't know what these, these two last digits mean, the 05, 15, 25, 35. I think that means that it's just the amount of 
uh, kind of separation it will have between the notes in terms of how detailed it will be. So in my guess is the higher the number, the more fine you can set the swing to it. Uh, but in this case, you're going to have to pick, is it an eighth note, is it in 16th note, or is it in 32 note? Now, the reason why I went with the 3205, first of all, there was a lot of experimentation. But the 3205 sounded the most natural for me, and obviously I needed to be in 32 notes because there are some parts of the song where I do either the fast snare rolls or I do some double basing where it was done in 32 notes. It wasn't done in 16th. So, and again, some music knowledge has to be applied over here, otherwise you're not going to know what you're doing. But if you know what time signature it's going to be in, and in this case, most of my track is in 32, I went ahead and put the 32 and the 05 on there. And the way you do that is you select all the drum parts that I want to apply it to, or any MIDI in this case, and you just go ahead and drag the swing onto all of them. You can consolidate all these tracks by highlighting all of them and doing Control J or Apple J if you have a Mac, and applying the swing to all of them. Now I'm gonna go ahead and delete this because I already have my swing over here. Yeah, essentially you just have to play with the bass over here. And like I said, my song, there was some parts that were done in 32 notes. So I left on 32. And the quantize feature is where it becomes key. Because basically what you wanna do is you wanna go ahead and play it. And 100% it's not affected. Is basically onto the downbeat. And what you want to do is you want to start lowering it and listening to it and seeing how it's sounding. Okay. Huh, where did the thing go? The... Oh, yeah. There you go. Okay, and keep in mind you want to have your MIDI map open over here while you're doing the swinging. <laughs> because the way, only way you can apply it is once you go ahead and apply the swing to your track, and once you listen to it and you decide which quantize setting here sounds the best. And by the way, you can also like mess with the timing and the random, the velocity, but go ahead and look at the description over here and see what they do first before you move along with it. But I generally, you know. I kind of used some intuition on that one of what I wanted it to do. But the most important is a quantize here. And once something sounds good, what you'll do is you'll go to the groove section over here of your MIDI track as you're editing the MIDI. And you'll go ahead and click on the swing 3205. Listen back to it just in case again to make sure that it's sounding like the way it is you want. And then hit commit. And now when you zoom into your hits, you'll see that it did commit and move your MIDI notes just slightly over, which is the most realistic as you can get. Because no drummer hits all the drum hits perfectly onto the grid. There's usually a little bit of uh, mere milliseconds of time that they either hit after or before the cue of the hit. So this applies, this combined with the, uh, with the velocities here, you can make MIDI drums sound pretty realistic. All right, now let's go over the the final phase of the way I mix and master is the mastering, which is basically kind of, uh, in case you didn't know what mastering is, what you're doing is you're preparing your track for the real world application, meaning you're going to get it ready for the smartphones, for the YouTubes, for the Spotify's, for the Instagrams, whatever, for the TV, for the radio. Now, in a professional setting, you would ideally have a different master for each of those applications. You'd have one specifically for your Instagram. You'd have one specifically for YouTube. You'd have one specifically for SoundCloud, for Spotify, for Apple Music, for a CD. The list goes on. Uh, generally, I don't go that far and beyond. I just kind of stick to one all-around good master that's good for any application. Uh, generally you'll get the best results of my mix doing it on YouTube because there really isn't much of a quality cap. But something like a cell phone, 
and whatnot. It might not be the most optimal, but what I learned is my method does work for every platform out there. And we're gonna go over my mastering techniques and what I did to make it sound pretty good. So I'll just close this, this drum bus so it doesn't get in the way. And uh, never mind about these two tracks, guys. These were just the intros right here. Very specific. Nothing crazy. A white noise riser. And my rhythm left guitar over here. And yeah, for this, basically, I just... Uh, uh, I did a sweep overdrive, so it would sweep in the EQ. So if you want to see the automation for that. This is how it goes. And by the way, that's one of my favorite things about digital recording it has to be probably automation it's made my life so much easier it kind of gave me a glimpse of how they used to do it in the analog world and it must have been a pain because if you do one wrong thing when you're trying to apply the effect you're gonna have to cut the tape and redo it again well, not necessarily cut the tape but you know what i mean you're gonna have to re-record over the tape make sure it's correct and then cut it's a pretty big hassle but luckily we li we're doing this in the digital world where it's much much easier but basically this is what my automation for the filter EQ is looking like. And I basically automated the uh, the filter frequency right here. So, so what will happen is if you look at the knob over here. I set it to increase as the track goes on so it can build you that nice intro. And yeah, um, if you're not sure where automations are, I do highly recommend looking up how to do automations in whatever DAW you're using because that's going to save you a lot of headaches when you're trying to figure out what effects to apply or what plugins to apply at certain places. And hell, even the, uh, the song tempo of the full song is automated right here. You know, this part when the song slows down, my tempo starts to slow down right here and it stays at a, even 130 over here. So we get to this part of the song where it just abruptly speeds up back to 165. I think at the end over here, you automate the tempo to go down to 160. Oh, whoops, sorry. Right over here. And nice and slow. This was for no reason right here, so don't even look at this automation. It, the song ends over here anyway, so it's not that important. So yeah, get an automation. It's very important. You can learn how to control any knob of your effect just using automation. But we'll go over that in another video. So going back to the master track. So um, I actually learned this from another YouTuber, uh, how to use stock Ableton effects for mastering back when I first got the, uh, this DAW and I didn't know much about what I was doing and I didn't have all the fancy plugins on my PC side and yet I had it on the Hackintosh side. So I kind of needed to know how to work all the plugins for mastering and, and this was the solution I came up with and it's really, really cool. Excuse me, I didn't come up with it but the guy's YouTube I checked out, he came up with it. Okay, how do I scroll to the other side? That's odd. Okay, then we could just do it like that. Perfect. Now guys, first and foremost, keep in mind that this plugin right here isn't doing anything. All it's really doing is just, it's transferring the signal out of my master into OBS so I can record the, uh, the track and you guys can hear everything I'm doing. It's not affecting the song whatsoever. This is just basically a hack to get my OBS signal out to, I'm sorry, my uh, Ableton signal out to OBS. And uh, I wish I can plug the YouTuber who showed me this, but basically it's a um, it's a restream standalone master plugin. It's completely free. You can look it up over here if you need to. It's from Reaper, which is another really famous DAW that a lot of people like to use. That's open source. Uh, so thank you, Reaper. Really cool. All right, so let's get into it. Now, here is where I start my, my mastering process, first and foremost. Uh, there's a really cool plugin called Utility over here. And what utility does is basically is what I use it for at least is it can give you some stereo separation in your track. And what I mean by that is if you look at this uh, bass mono button over here along with this solo button, what you can do is you can segregate 
whatever bass frequencies you want to stay in the middle of your track, in the middle of your oral spectrum. And that will remain mono no matter what. And everything else, you can use this with button over here to spread out the signal. And this is really effective for rock and metal guitar stuff because what you can do is you can leave all the bass signals mono and you can have that those guitars nice and spread out so it's a nice stereo feel. So if you guys want, let's take a listen and see what that does. So what I do first and foremost is I'll hit the solo button over here with the bass mono activated. And what I'll do is I'll find the frequency right about where the kick drum is just starting to come in. So obviously here, this is sub range. We're not getting any kick drum. So I'll go ahead and raise it until I just start to get some kick drum. I want to say right about here. Great. So now the bass has been completely monoed. And we'll start with the 100% width over here and let me show you what it does. So what we can do is, we can slowly start to spread the width. And you can hear the guitars are going even more left and right. They're covering the left and right a lot more. Now I don't like to apply too much, just a little bit because I already do have the guitars pan left and right over here. So I do somewhere around like 115 generally for every song. You can go more if you want. 142, 115. I think I generally like it around 115. I don't want it to go too left and right field. I like it to be somewhere meshing with the bass guitars. Yeah, let me turn the loop off. All right, and next up is I do a little bit of fine EQ for the master. And listening back to the track, I realized that there were just a couple of little ugly frequencies I didn't like. One being over here at the 800 to 900 range and one of them being right over here at the 150 hertz range. You guys want to hear what that sounds like. Yeah, that's a very honky frequency there. So here's what it sounds like without. That's what it sounds like with. It kind of sounds a little cleaner, right? Without. With. And then, <clears throat> okay, up next is based on the recommendation that that one YouTuber gave me is we're going to apply a little bit of glue compression, but there is a preset in Ableton called Mastering, Make It Loud. And you can find that in your audio effects, glue compressor, and it's down over here, Mastering, Make It Loud. And what I do over here is I don't mess with any of the settings besides the threshold and the makeup in here. So what I did was... I apply as much threshold where the signal started to peak at around 5 dB. So I never let it get into the range past 5 dB because that's what you want for like a mastering range. 5 dB is a pretty good even level. That should work in any application. Okay, and then moving on, uh, we did apply a little bit of saturator. Or saturation into the final mix that way the the frequencies can all uh, kind of cohesively get molded into one another it's kind of, saturation is kind of a weird weird technique uh, understanding it is even weirder but once you kind of get the gist of it you'll realize what it's doing to your frequency range and basically it's kind of like injecting all the frequencies with some distorting drug basically so uh, there is a preset we use for this called a bit warmer and you'll find this in the saturator a bit warmer which is the first one right there just drag that in and i think the only the only thing you're going to mess with on this one is just the drive i think it was standard at zero db but i went ahead and raised it up to the sixes region that's what sounded really good for me okay cool moving on on the master chain is i used a the standard limiter plugin over here and this one I really didn't mess with too much. The only thing I messed with was the ceiling over here, which is basically the loudest you want your song to go to. That's essentially what a limiter is. A limiter can bring your lowest points of the track a little higher. So kind of like think of it as an expander. It expands that it expands the lower sounding parts of your track and kind of brings it up higher. That's one function of a limiter. 
And then the other function of the limiter is that it will not pass a certain threshold in your DB of your final track. And I do not want my song to go past negative three, three DB. So I set the negative three DB here in the ceiling and just let it do its magic. You can see here the meter, it's showing you how much of the signal is being brought down so it doesn't get past negative 3 dB. So if you're seeing more of the yellow bar come down here, it means that it's way louder than the negative 3 dB and it's bringing it down. And you can get some really good effects like that. Sometimes it's an effect that you're actually trying to get where it sounds like a really kind of like a crushed sound in some ways, like a, like a squeezed sound. Compressors do that too, but in a limiter, it's kind of different. You hear a very squeezed and loud, punchy sound. Okay, moving on. Now, this Ulean plugin, I'll admit, is not a stock Ableton plugin, and you really don't need this. This is more for my analyzation tool over here. And basically, what this free plugin does is it just kind of measures everything for you in terms of the DB and the LUs. And um, the only one I was really looking into was the integrated one, not the short term or the loudness, but I was basically me measuring what the dynamic range of my track was. And here's another thing I was always looking at is, is it actually limiting down to negative three dB? And as you can see here, it is. It's not going past negative three dB whatsoever. So yeah, you don't have to use this, but I like to use it in all my tracks just so I can kind of gauge what's going on with the LUs and what the true peak of the song is right here. Okay guys, so that's basically it. I think I went over everything when it comes to mixing for this song. If there's anything you think I missed or I didn't cover regarding the tracking, uh, the guitar processing, the drum processing, the bass processing, and the master channel, please let me know and I'll definitely address it. But again, if there's certain things that you didn't catch in this video of what I was doing, please like and subscribe. I'm going to try and go over little tidbits about recording, some little tricks and secrets here. That's going to help your production game grow a little bit, especially when it comes to metal producing in Ableton. But yeah, let me know, and I'm here to help. Thank you guys so much. Take care.